at a young, uh, since a young age, he went on and studied biology at Grand Valley State University, graduating in 2005, mm -hmm. is that correct? Uh, and at that time, he worked at a vet's office as well. And from there, kind of gained a passion of helping out animals, uh, which has extended into his turtle rehab. So he is one of the few licensed turtle rehab specialists here in Michigan. Um, and we're very excited for Scott to be joining us today to tell us more about our Michigan turtle species and about um, rehab and what you do. So thank you for joining us, Scott. All right, thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Um, and as Pat had said, uh, we're gonna go through the Michigan turtle species. A lot of them will probably be familiar with you, for you guys. A little bit of what, why I got where I'm at and then also what I do is the rehab aspect. Um, room for questions at the end. If it's something quick while we're going through it, go ahead and feel free to you know, raise your hand and everything that way. And I did bring some with me tonight that we can kind of go over after the presentation and tell you kind of what stage of rehab they're at, what the injury or initial injury was and things like that here. So a lot of this is already kind of hit on real quick, but yeah, I graduated from Grand Valley. I work in the wastewater field now. I run a wastewater plant for the city of Granville. I am uh, licensed through the International Wildlife Rehab Council and also the state of Michigan. Nobody cares about that stuff though. I mean, I grew up on a lake. I love the outdoors. I love the water, you know, whether it's fishing, kayaking, boating, and just I've always had a soft spot for turtles. Um, kind of that has always uh, just continued on throughout my whole life and everything. Um, I have turtles that come to me every year that I know are older than I am. So the fact that they caught themselves in a bad spot, maybe I was crossing the wrong road at the wrong time, I like to be able to give them some supportive care and see if we can get them back out there and that, so. So um, the biggest thing I run into with the rehab aspect is proper identification. You know, I, obviously I'm assuming everybody in this room has an interest in turtles, so you guys are probably pretty familiar with the local species, more so than the average, you know, citizen. But uh, at the same token, I figured it'd be good to kind of go through each of them for a little interactive, um, you know, does anybody know how many species of turtles we have here in Michigan? Ten. It is 10, yep. Yep, absolutely. If you've gone through this, this uh, their little display out there, you'll see a lot of the answers in here. So, um, so I've got kind of the next slides I've got set up is I've got a pictures of a various type of turtle. And if you guys can answer it, just blurt out what it is, which species that is. Yeah, that's a snapper. It's one of the easier ones for sure. Um, that is our Eastern snapping turtle. Um, most everybody's pretty familiar with these guys. They're one of our larger turtle species that we have here in Michigan. Um, males and females are right about the same size in these guys. As you can see on the distribution map there, they are found everywhere. Uh, big thing with them is they like permanent source of water. So they will wander a bunch in their life especially during breeding season, but they like a permanent water source and they'll move from one to the next. Um, they also can tolerate polluted waters quite easily, which is why we see them quite often. You know, um, some of our protected species that we'll get into later really don't handle polluted waters. So as we interfere with our ecosystems around us, some species can handle that a little better than others. The ones that are more common, obviously are the ones that are gonna handle pollution a little bit better. So what about this guy? Does anybody know what this one is? Another fairly common one here. Yep, it is a painted turtle. Um, I would consider these one of our medium sized turtles, um, about four to 10 inches or so. Males are quite a bit smaller than the females for these and very long front claws. It's kind of one of the easy ways to tell them apart. Um, this map's a little bit different because we actually have two subspecies of the painted turtle in Michigan. The one that's in the whole lower peninsula is the Midland painted turtle. The far west side of the UP, we actually get into the western painted turtle and then they kind of interbreed in the middle there. Um, biggest way to tell their difference is the plastron, which is the bottom shell. The westerns have a lot more pattern on there, whereas the Midland painted turtles have got a pretty faint line right in the center of it. They uh, really don't like current for their habitat. You know, they like a lot of quieter, slow moving, lakes, ponds, streams. Um, they can also tolerate pretty high organic pollution. So from farm fields, from residential development, another reason why they're one of the pretty common ones that we see, you know, throughout 
to start interacting with nature. This one is also fairly common. One of our smallest species here in the state. Anybody know what this one is? It is a musk, yep. So yeah, the Eastern musk turtle. Another name for it is the stink pot um, because they do have musk glands that when they're really stressed or bothered, they can release to release a musky smell. Um, they're really say about three to five and a half inches or so. So one of our smaller ones. They are quite common, but you don't see them a whole lot because they don't really leave the water a whole lot. And they like that transition from land to water with all that heavy vegetation there. Um, you know, the algae, the weed growth, you know, even maybe tall cattails. So um, their biggest impact is development of that. You know, everybody likes their nice green lawn to run right down to a nice sandy beach. No spot for these guys then. So, you know, that's a big thing that affects them quite a bit. And yeah, the same thing, they like slower moving water and that, and that heavy, you know, plant vegetation that way. Here's a, another fairly common one. I kayaked part of the Muskegon this weekend river and saw these guys everywhere. You know which one this one is? I heard it. Somebody said map turtle. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, they're another one that's quite common, especially in our larger river systems. Uh, they eat snails and clams and little bivalves. So any water system that has a lot of that, they're going to do really well. Um, zebra mussels is one they eat a lot of. Um, so like, you know, the Grand River, the Muskegon, you know, Kalamazoo is loaded up with these guys. The biggest thing they're probably a little more sensitive to is if it's a heavily polluted like city river, you know, a lot of times the little, their food source is affected by that heavy pollution. So as a result, they're going to be displaced as well. So there's some localized areas where you won't find them so much, but for the most part, our rivers, you know, we can find them pretty easily. And, they handle the really fast moving currents quite well. Uh, they don't have a ton of predators because you know they don't leave the water a whole lot other than to bask. Um, I consider them one of our little bit medium to large turtles ranging there from you know four to not quite 11 inches. Females are about twice the size of the males on these guys. So if you see a log with four or five big ones and four or five little ones, it's probably half males, half females, or maybe some juveniles there growing out. So. All right, what about this one? Another one that's fairly large. This one does have a long neck, long nose, leathery type shell, a little different than our other ones. This is the Eastern Spiny Soft Shell. Um, they are right about the same size as, you know, our big snappers. They'll hit, you know, 18, 19 inches there. These ones, the females are about the whole size of the males. And yeah, they uh, are unique because they have a leathery type shell rather than a hard shell like you think of with a turtle. Um, they are very fast on land actually. So they don't really come into my rehab very often at all. They are pretty good at eluding people in cars and, uh, they really like a source of water that with a soft bottom, you know, whether that's sand or mud, because they will hide down there in underneath the sand and silt and both ambush prey for fish in that. It's also one of their defense mechanisms. If you spook them, they'll shoot out and normally hide in the, you know, down in the bottom and everything that way. As a result, like I say, I don't see them too often in my rehab aspect. Probably the biggest impact to them and their population is they really like to lay their eggs on nice sandy banks. Raccoons love frequenting those and they predate a lot of the nests. Also, you know, a lot of times they nest right in people's front yards and stuff like that where people also may mess with them a little bit or disturb their nesting. But raccoons are a big predator of the nests of these guys. So they, you won't really find them too often in parts of a river that have a lot of rocks or sharp rocks for that matter, because of that shell structure that they have. Um, you can normally find them basking early spring quite easily too, or laying there in like the floating seaweed and algae, they'll bask in there quite easily. Yeah. 
They have those pointy noses, right? They do have a very long nose. Um, and that's for them to hide in the bottom and they'll put that long neck up and, uh, you know, kind of stick their nose out of it to get a breath there. They also can reach that long neck beyond 50% of behind their shell. So grabbing them on the sides does not always mean you're not going to be messed with a little bit that way. So, all right. Does anybody know what this one is? It is. Yep. That's a red-eared slider. So they um, are kind of unique in the sense of historically, they've been shown up to be carried out throughout the whole state. Now, though, there's just very localized populations of them. There's a lot of people that actually believe those populations were origin or originated from released pet turtles. And, you know, you look at it, there are some populations around some of the busier towns and that. So it's possible. Um, they can live in this environment and everything quite well. The Muskegon River does have quite a few red ear sliders. I did see some when I was out this weekend on there. They're uh, also, uh, I'd say, medium to large turtle. Um, female, so that bigger shell there is actually from a female red ear slider. I found that one a couple of years ago out in the wild, just the shell. Um, males are about half that size. Also very long front claws in that here. And um, like I say, they're really scattered. And like I say, there's a lot of people that believe that's because it's maybe a little different lineage than our original ones that we have. Why don't they make them illegal, like over four inches, I think? Yep, so. probably drop them into the water because they couldn't have them anymore. Yeah, so the red ear slider is the most common pet turtle for decades now. Um, they were the ones that, you know, in the 60s, you could always find a little dime-sized turtles that were they're still reproducing, you know, they're produced for the pet trade in very high numbers. Um, all turtles can carry salmonella, like a lot of reptiles. Um, so yeah, it's, pet stores cannot sell a turtle under four inches um, as a pet. So um, red ear sliders are not real finicky on the type of environment they live in, other than they just need a permanent water source. Um, they can be found in slower moving backwaters or even right on the main river. They're uh, they're pretty good at adjusting, so once they get established, they usually do quite well. All right, what about this one? This is probably the one that most times when it's turned into me, people don't know what it is. It is, yep, it's a blanding. So the bright yellow chin is a dead giveaway. They have that from the day they are born. So um, they are. Um, it is one of our protected species. Uh, Michigan has four protected species. Uh, the Blanding's turtle is one of them. As you can see, they're found in quite a bit of Michigan. They are um, quite vulnerable and generally their numbers are declining because they take a very long time to reach reproductive age. Um, a lot of people say in the wild about 20 years before they're gonna start reproducing. Um, they also are a turtle that will wander from water source to water source, much like a snapping turtle. So I do get a lot of these guys in because, you know, they're the more that you're out of a you know body of water, you're going to run into cars, you're going to run into people, you're going to run into predators, and you know, unfortunately, all of those are pretty good sources of why they end up with my care. Um, they are uh, found a little bit up in the UP there, and uh, these guys really like shallow marshes. They can swim quite well, but they also can do just as well in six inches of water. Uh, they eat a lot of both uh, plant life and, you know, animal proteins in that. So, um, but yeah, they are quite active on land. So you will see these guys crossing the road quite a bit. Probably my favorite Michigan turtle. Anybody know what that one is? Yep, it is. Um, I love how variable they are. Uh, no two look alike. Uh, they're not very big, um, about four and a half to eight inches, it says. I don't know if I've seen one quite that big, but uh, they are um, protected. Uh, another one of our protected ones. Actually, that's the wrong scientific name up there. I just caught that. So um, that's what happens when you duplicate the slide and change the description <laughs> in the picture. Sometimes you miss things. So, um, but, uh, you know, they are localized areas that their numbers are doing very well but across their whole range, their numbers are declining. A lot of that is human interaction, 
cars uh, breaking up of their habitat. They really like uh, wetland or uh, wooded areas that are kind of near a water source. So like a nice forest with a little stream source there, maybe with a field next to it is they love that kind of stuff quite a bit. Um, usually a sandy type soil, not a real heavy clay or you know, that soil that way. Um, so it's easy for them to dig in, but then also to lay their eggs and things like that. There's a lot of uh, research out there that shows they're, um, if they're not disturbed, their home range will only be an acre or two for their whole life. So once, if they're happy there, they don't really have a reason to leave. And, you know, you'll, they pop up in a lot of unusual areas. Um, there's a couple of parks and very busy parts of Grand Rapids that have these guys that are surprised when I go there and see them. So. All right, here's another one that some people know, but I would say a lot of people generally don't know what these guys are. These are found in the Muskegon River, a um, little bit in the Rogue River, and then further north they get a little more common. That is the wood turtle, yeah. They look a lot like a snapper when they're hatchlings. Uh, they have a really long tail, um, kind of a uniform color, so they're kind of commonly confused with snappers when they're little guys. Um, they are another one of our protected ones, so that brings us up to three of the four protected ones here. As you can see, they're found on the northern half of the lower peninsula and most of the UP. I would put them at, you know, medium to large turtle, you know, six to 10 inches roughly. Um, really uh, another one that spends about half of its time on land and half of its time in the water. They're very unique in that sense. Uh, they'd be considered semi-terrestrial and they will forage and eat like a box turtle when they're on land and then if they're in the water and they find a dead fish or something like that or a worm, they'll gladly eat it there as well. Not real good swimmers, so usually you'll find them in areas where it's a clean, you know, clean water, but then a gradual slope going up to a bank. Because they're, like you say, they're not real good at swimming, so they, you know, like to kind of more walk along the bottom rather than actually swimming like you would think of as a turtle that way. Um, they uh, usually are found in like a sandy or a smoother rock bottom, but I have seen them outside of that a little bit as well. You know, they're um, probably their biggest predator or issue with their numbers is raccoons. Raccoon numbers are really climbing quite a bit. And these guys spend a lot of time on land, but really don't have any defense against a raccoon. Uh, you know, a box turtle or a landings turtle actually has a hinge on their plastron where they can kind of close up. A wood turtle does not. So um, they run across a raccoon and the raccoon has nothing but time on its hands, so it can keep messing with it and get a hold of it. And there's been a lot of um, research showing now that the raccoons up north are learning to eat the females when they're laying their eggs. So not only the nest, but they also take out mom. So that's uh, quite disturbing. And um, there's a lot of people working on looking at doing more of a jumpstart program for these because their numbers seem to be declining a little quicker than some of our other species. And a lot of that's actually not human interaction this time. A lot of it is natural predators. So this is our final turtle of Michigan, um, a very elusive turtle. Uh, I don't see it very often. Anybody know what this one is? Yeah, it is a spotted turtle, so, yeah. And uh, these guys are actually federally protected. Uh, they are protected in all of the U.S., their entire range, so they are considered threatened. The other three protected species are protected at a state level only. So the state of Michigan's protecting them. Um, these are actually controlled by, you know, or the regulations are set out by the Federal Fish and Wildlife. They are a fairly small turtle, you know, three and a half to five and a half inches. Males and females are right about the same size in these guys. Coloration and uh, plastron shape are probably the only way to really differentiate a male from a female. They are, um, biggest reason for their decline is habitat destruction. They really like bogs real clean water, so they're really prone to areas being polluted. Uh, fens they really like, which is basically like a flooded grassland type area. Um, that's the range for them. They're very segmented as far as you'll find a pocket population here and there. Um, not very common. Um, 
up until I started kind of getting really serious about field herping, I'd only seen two in my life type of thing. So they're, um, they're not an easy one to find. Like I say, they are quite protected as well. Has anybody here ever seen one in the wild? Yeah. Have you? Okay, very cool. Yeah, they're a neat one. And the two I saw prior to actually spending some serious time looking for them were crossing the road in spots where, why are you here? You know, so it was uh, kind of just rare instances there a little bit. So as we went through those a little bit, I've got a few slides here as uh, kind of a little test of uh, what kind of turtles do you see in these pictures? Yeah, absolutely. A blanding's right there in the center. Other ones are painted turtles, so pretty common there. There's another one. A nice yellow chin, another blanding's there. Like I say, they're one that I find that's the most uh, mis-ID'd with what I deal with. Um, so this one probably aren't going to show up real good. That's actually two different types of turtles there. So the one on the right is actually a juvenile blandings turtle. And when they're very small, the speckling of the shell is quite prevalent. And the one on the left there is actually a juvenile spotted turtle. Um, if you could see their heads, the, you would see a bright yellow chin on the one on the right, whereas obviously a spotted turtle has a you know, you know, nice black head with yellow spots found both of these right about two years ago, right at the same exact environment. So I was like, it was kind of cool. I mean, yeah. one of the only areas that I've seen both of those overlap pretty routinely. So that kind of is kind of just a quick run through of our 10 species that we have in Michigan, where you can kind of really see them. Um, now we're going to kind of transition a little bit into the rehab work that I do. Um, as we kind of mentioned, I was a vet tech as I was going through college. Uh, the animal hospital I worked at did wildlife rehab. Uh, we kind of stabilized their medical, major medical aspects and then shipped them out to various rehab places. And I quickly realized that when a turtle came in, there wasn't a real good next spot to send it to. Now, as soon as you said snapper, nobody had space. So not very many people like dealing with those. Obviously, with my interest in the outdoors and that, that's kind of where turtles have always had a little bit of a soft spot because they're such a long lived animal that, you know, takes a long time to get to reproductive age. It's not, you know, the cute little furry mammal that everybody wants to rehab that's orphaned. That really is just part of the life cycle, <laughs> you know? Um, but so yeah, the big things, I mean, I get a lot of them that are hit by cars. Um, that's probably the number one reason. And the amount of times that I hear somebody drop one off that, they stop to save it, to move it across the road, and then the car behind them just hit it or swerved for it. It's, unfortunately, I hear that story an awful lot, and it's, uh, it's sad for sure. Another big one is infections. So if you look at the right ear slider picture at the bottom, its eye is quite swollen and swollen shut. So a turtle like that, usually you'll see that after they come out of hibernation in the spring. That's one that you know, if you see something like that, should we should get it to a licensed rehabber. Um, urinary tract infections in turtles actually are quite common as well. And uh, a lot of times the symptoms of that is it's just going to be very listless. You know, it's not, you're going to handle it, it's just kind of, maybe it's very slow with its movements, or you see it kind of coming up on shore at the same spot day after day, and it just kind of lays there all sprawled out. You know, that's a, another sign of that. Um, Turtles being cold blooded have a very slow metabolism. So they can really sit with an infection for a very long time as it's just sitting there brewing and, you know, taking a hold a little more, a little more, a little more. And then eventually, it, basically, they can succumb to it if they don't have, you know, some sort of interaction that way to, you know, obviously get them on the right path. Predator run ins, um, dogs. I have dogs, I love them. Don't just let them chew up or whatever in the backyard. Raccoons are a big one, and then people, you know, painting the shells or whatever type of thing. Um, displaced individuals, so like, you know, land is being developed. You know, construction's going on and, you know, that area is getting developed or changed. That's a big one that I'll get ones from. Birds of prey, sometimes we'll pick them up and drop them in random spots. Um, and then another, the last one is really unfortunate, it's confiscated turtles. 
So those four protected turtles you can't own. Um, and then, you know, the DNR is going to step in and then they come back to me. And, you know, I have no idea where they came from. The people don't want to admit that even knowing what it was. So unfortunately, confiscated ones, you know, a lot of times we can try to rehab them to go back to the wild or they go to nature centers. But you know, those are, there's no rehab needed for those. They should have been left in the wild in the first place. So. So a little bit of what to do when you run across a turtle. Um, obviously, if you see one crossing the road, I'd appreciate it if you stop, help it cross, move in the direction it's moving. You know, don't put it, even if it doesn't look like it should be going over there, if you put it on the side of the road where it came from, it's probably going to just cross right after you leave. So move in the direction it's going. If you stop and it's already been hit, you know, look for the wounds or anything that way. And then, you know, if it's a snapping turtle, regardless of the size, don't pick it up by its tail. So the tail is connected to its vertebrae. So and snappers can get quite large, you know, and if you pick it up by the tail, you can a lot of times dislocate the, some of their spine that's actually right at the base of that tail. So I, um, I brought with some turtles tonight that we'll go over after the presentation. One of them is a snapper. Um, I would always recommend you grab them at the back of the shell, basically above each rear leg. They're not gonna be able to bite you at that point. You're gonna have two hands to really support the weight really nice. You can just move them right across the road set them back on the way they're going. So, and then if you do have an injured one, you know, the biggest thing is we need to get it to a licensed wildlife rehabber. Uh, preferably one that works with turtles. Turtles do rehab quite a bit differently than our warm blooded animals. So the medications we use are quite a bit different. You know, we need a really slow, long-term acting antibiotic, you know, and the pain meds are quite a bit different as well, just because of the way they metabolize them. Um, I've got a couple pictures there of the way I recommend people to set them up if they find a turtle that they're not going to be able to drive right to a rehabber. I mean, obviously, not everybody's going to have an empty tote and a towel in their car, so make do with whatever you have. But at the same token, sometimes work schedules mean that you're going to have to keep it for a short time before you can drop it off somewhere. So I always put them in a tote, I wet a towel, and then I elevate the end of the tote so you can see it's just sitting up just a little bit. So basically that moisture is going to just be on the one end. And then the big thing is keep it inside. Flies love turtle wounds. You know, a turtle's not gonna roll over to get them, get, you know, to get the flies away or scratch them away or anything that way. Flies love going into turtle wounds and they lay their eggs right away. And then a couple of days later, you have maggots. It's very treatable, but it just is one more step that if we can keep it inside away from flies is much appreciated. So when, they, when I get an injured turtle, or I do um, have a lot of them dropped off at the water facility that I run, it works very well and my staff knows how to set them up until I get there. Big thing we wanna do is get uh, pain meds and antibiotics on board right away. Pain meds, because obviously there's an injury, they don't process pain like we do, but they still feel pain. So you know their shell is much like a broken bone. So, you know, it can be quite painful. And then because we're having an injury, we want to make sure you get antibiotics on board. Because like I mentioned, infections are very prominent in these guys. And they can, they can look like they're doing fine. And there's actually a low-grade infection just sitting there brewing. I'm going to flush and clean those wounds and kind of assess everything that way. And then temporarily stabilize any shell fracture. And that's a lot of times done with either tape or wrapping. You know, the biggest thing is we can't necessarily see the extent of the internal injuries that are going on. You know, and I get in enough turtles that I can't just run everyone to the vet day one for x-rays. You know, so I do a lot of supportive care for the first few days and see what the secondary, you know, more internal, you know, injuries are going to be and what's going on there. Once we kind of get past that initial shock, and they're, they're, you know, they're perking up, they're doing well, alert. Then we look at doing some long-term shell repairs to stabilize that stuff very closely. And all of this work is done with close work with a veterinarian. I work with a couple of local vets quite a bit for, you know, they say when I need, you know, medications, I need x-rays or something like that. But the first thing is like, you know, stabilize what's going on and make sure they're gonna make it past day one before we rush off and do all of the x-rays. And the medications that are used are not medications that can be acquired 
over the counter anywhere for human stuff. And it's all injectable stuff that way. So, so these are a few different ones that I've worked with over the years that, you know, I had a nice progression of photos of the names were given to them by the people that brought them to me. So Hope was a juvenile blanding turtle that came from the Traverse City area. She was assumed by hit by a car. She was found on the side of the road. You can see she was missing a portion of the shell there, um, kind of right here. There's also a crack that kind of runs up along the side here. Hope was with me for right about a year. And uh, as you can see, like the next photo here, you know, there was a, it's starting to granulate in. When we have a large portion of the shell missing like that, I do not cover it with a bandage or a cast. Or I should, not a permanent bandage. I do wet to dry bandages, so that's changed every single day. So that you basically wet the bandage with different medications on there. And then the dead tissue will stick to that bandage. So as you peel it off the next day, you're removing the necrotic tissue and then leaving the healthy tissue right there. And this was a photo right shortly before she was released. And you can kind of see she's still missing that portion. But this scar tissue is just about as hard as the shell. So, yeah, you know, her shell modeling days are long over. But you know what? She's going to live to be a very, you know, very successful addition back to the wild. And this photo was actually taken about three weeks after she was released by the person that, you know, found her, came back down, and we got her back up there. And she sent me this photo about three weeks later and said, look who I saw today out on my walk. And that was pretty cool. So the next one here is Tulip. Um, she's a little baby box turtle. Um, photo's a little dark, but there's a cut right on her shell and kind of right here. And this uh, gentleman found her in an area that had just been brush hogged. So she was hit probably by a lawnmower of some sort or the brush hog. Um, with her, I, since the shell just really had to be just held right where it was, you know, there wasn't really a lot of play in there. I used basically wire in these little mounts to basically just give it secondary support so that it could, you know, it's much like a broken bones. As long as you have it close together, it's going to slowly grow back together in that here. And this was when she was released. This one was also about a year. Um, it takes quite a while for those shells to heal and everything, but, uh, you know, and she went right back off the mode path. We took her in the woods a little bit, but, you know, it's kind of unfortunately some of that stuff is going to happen, but. And this is another uh, Blanding's turtle. Um, I guess I lied. This one I did name Patch because every time I did the bandage, it just looked like it had a patch on its shell. So this one was, um, we believe, hit by a lawnmower. They found uh, this turtle like this where it was missing this big chunk of the shell. And um, a lot of, um, this one came from the Tawas area, so over by past Saginaw. Five other vets and rehabbers said that this turtle should be euthanized on the spot. Um, they knew it was a Blanding's turtle and it was very alert and very active. And um, so they called me and said, hey, this is a story. And I said, well, I said, we can do what we can for her and see. Um, and it recovered extremely well. Um, so I spent a long time in the, just a patch like that with actually gauze wet and those pushed down in here just to kind of get that necrotic tissue off. And you can see the progression of the photos here of, you know, kind of where we are starting to granulate in. And this one I talked to quite a few specialists about because there was chunks of the shell that were not attached any longer, like to the edges, but they were still attached to the inner membrane and it was opted to leave them here. And you can actually even see there's little chunks here for quite a while of dead type material of shell. And eventually they did come off and this turtle was released again took about a year and a half before this one was able to be released. But uh, that was kind of a kind of a neat one because they're like, we already were told it was supposed to be put down. And uh, Blanding's turtles are much like snappers. They're very stubborn. They're very, you know, so they rehab quite well. Um, painted turtles are one that are a little more sensitive. So, you know, they don't handle as many severe injuries as like the snappers and Blanding's seem to. And then here's a few other just pictures that I had of various things that I've bandaged up over the years. This Blandians was had a crack right on the side where the plasteron and carapace come together. Um, this is a casting type material that's used in the human side a lot for yeah broken bones and that you heat it up with a hair dryer, it gets soft, 
you wrap it around there and then it gets really hard again. So that's, you know, she wore that for about a year while that healed up. And it was nice because it's still open so you can see it fairly well. Snapper with some, you know, secondary support there of zip ties and a little bit of epoxy there, a little bit of wire on this one. These were missing little chunks of the shell. So, you know, that's where we left them taped and bandaged that way. Painter with, you know, some other secondary support here as well. Like I said, as long as you get the shell close together, it will fill in and grow back together. You know, a lot of that is obviously say keeping antibiotics and anti-inflammatories on board the whole time. So another aspect that I run into a lot of, because there's a lot of turtles that are coming to me at, you know, during egg laying season, is they will either lay while they're with me or maybe their injury was fatal. Well, if they're full of eggs, they were probably out getting ready to lay. So I do recover the eggs from any of the adult females that come in that have eggs with them already. Um, so this, paint, or this uh, box turtle released, uh, laid these four eggs when she came in. She was one that um, came to me by a construction worker and the whole area was getting developed. There was no woods to be left anywhere. And he brought her to me and then three days later, she's laying a nest in that. So um, this clutch of map turtle eggs were from a female that had a, a head injury that was not able to be rehabbed. Um, all 10 of the eggs hatched and this was the little ones being released there. So. I do get a lot of eggs every year, unfortunately, just because, you know, females come in, there's about 150 eggs incubating right now from painters and snappers and about everything you can think of. So um, that's always something a lot of people that aren't familiar with turtles don't even think about the egg aspect when they get a female in, you know, well, that's one of the number one reasons why they're going to get hit by a car is they're out laying their eggs. It might be the only time that turtle ever leaves the water. So Unfortunately, it does take out a lot of them. So I wanted to take a moment for my references. Um, a lot of the pictures that I used came off of the Michigan Herp Atlas. That's a really interesting website where, you know, if you witness an animal that, you know, you want to take pictures of and kind of log it, they don't give exact locations. They'll just give county. But um, it's a really neat way. Or if you're trying to find something or see where it was last seen, that's a really neat website there for that. And that one's connected with the Herpetological Resource and Management Team. Uh, Dave Misfund, is, which is the author of one of these books, is a good friend of mine. And he's one that also is a big one into, you know, preservation and ecology for our reptiles and amphibians. Everybody thinks about it for protected birds or butterflies. You know, the reptiles and amphibian side, for the most part, is kind of overlooked a little bit, you know those cold slimy animals nobody wants to deal with, right? So, um, and then the Turtle Rescue of the Hamptons is a very large rescue group in New Jersey. And they're one that have helped with a lot of, you know, if I've got an odd case early on that I wasn't quite sure the best way to handle it, um, they've done a really nice job, you know, helping me out with stuff like that here. So, um, at that point, um, kind of just want to open up for general questions before we kind of go over the live turtles I brought. And yes, snakes are cool too. Yes. So, um, and then, yeah, if you guys have any further questions or anything, my phone number and email are right up there as well. So that way, so cool. Well, thank you very much for coming out too. So thank you. yeah. So the ones I brought, I brought four of them with me that are at various stages of we have at this point. This one is a eastern box turtle. She came in uh, last July um, and was chewed on by a neighbor's dog. Um, did a pretty good number on the shell. The shell should come out here about another three quarters of an inch and uh, all of that was chewed off as you can see trauma kind of all over the shell. So the dog definitely spent quite a bit of time with it. Um, no leg injuries or anything like that. Um, you know, we're kind of working through that a little bit. I don't know if she is because her hinge works, but it doesn't close up because there's so much shell here missing. So um, it's one that I've talked a little bit to the DNR about and see what their recommendation is on this, you know, and what they think if she should be released or not. Um, 
with our protected species, if they're not releasable, they are quite easy to usually place in a nature center or an educational type aspect that way. So, you know, that's the good news that way. Or that way. Scott, we had a question. Someone asked, is that Foxy? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah, that's the person that turned her in last year. So, that is. Oh, Scott? Yeah. Could the kids come up a little closer so they could see their turtles better? Yeah, absolutely. So, and this one is a wood turtle. It just came in a few weeks ago. I would anticipate it was probably a raccoon injury. We're lose, we lost about half of this front leg and about a third of this one, as well as part of the tail. Um, and she obviously has had a run in at a previous time in her younger days because she's missing a good chunk of the shell here and it's kind of disformed a little bit that way. So she will be releasable. Um, these guys do quite well when they're missing a limb here or a limb there. She's got pretty much full use of the front right. You know, and even though it's a little shorter, she can still actually um, move around quite well. And I don't think she'll have any issues, you know, swimming or anything that way either because they're not a strong swimmer to begin with. So. I do anticipate she'll be able to be released here. So. And we brought a uh, landings turtle with. So this one was hit by a car. It's got a pretty large cracked piece right here. This one's been with me for about two weeks now. And it also has a crack kind of running down the shell here as well. Um, she's one that we're going to probably wire up her shell uh, probably this weekend and uh, she'll be past the kind of like the taping stage at this point. So um, she also has a previous injury. She's missing this rear leg. So it's been before she came, you know, it's an old injury. It's pretty common to find turtles in the wild, especially the ones that spend more time on the on land missing a limb. So like I say, they can do quite well even if they have lost one in that. So. Last one I brought here is a little snapping turtle. So this one was hit by a car, missing a pretty good chunk of the shell here. Um, and this is, like I say, when I mentioned, this is kind of how you want to pick them up. It's kind of right above the rear legs. Grab, you can grab the shell nice and firm there. They may snap and hiss and everything like that, but they can't get you at that point. So. Um, this isn't a real big one, but you know, a nice mature animal for sure. So, and that's the personality of why they rehab so well. You know, they, uh, they're stubborn and they fight all the way to the end. So, but yeah, so. <laughs> Those were the four I brought with tonight. So I figured you'd get a little bit of a mix. No, and that's part of why that one came, actually. I'm like, you don't have all kinds of algae all over you. You don't stink too bad. I was like, you know, so. I have a question. Yeah. How do you tell their age? You know, when it's a younger turtle, it's easy to tell because you can actually count the annuli or the rings on their scoots. Once they reach an adult stage, that's not accurate any longer because they don't shed that every single year. So it's just a guess. Um, the larger they are, the smoother or more worn looking the shell is, is all indicators. You know, um, most of these are, you know, adults. So I would say they're probably in that 15 to 30 range. Um, the three toed there in the audience, that's an older turtle. because you see how smooth the shell is and everything? So that one, you know, could be 40, 50. So, yeah, so, you know, that way. So, you know, especially when they're in the wild, the, you know, their shell gets more worn and that, so, yeah, good. We have a question from online. Do you keep each turtle in rehab separate or do some species rehab together? So their initial injuries are always kept separate. They're um, all set up in totes of various sizes. Once they get to the point before release, I do have some outdoor pens that they will go together and snappers always have to be separate. Um, they just, they're feisty enough to each other, but um, I've got a couple pens, one that's set up a little more for box turtles and wood turtles, one that's more for water turtles and that, so. They'll go together at that stage. So, yep. That's all.
Um, so I know you said people bring you turtles a lot, but they find. Um, mm -hmm. you also like go out and scour the woods here. So I spend a lot of time in the woods, so I do run across ones that need help periodically. 95% of what I get, people come to me. So if you pull up the Michigan State licensed rehabber list, I'm right on there. If you call the DNR, you call Wildlife Rehab Center, Glanford, they all give out my name. So um, I do only, well, I only do reptiles really, but I don't really get snakes very often because they don't really survive hits and stuff like that. So. Most everything is turtles, but um, I don't do anything with birds or mammals or any of that stuff. So, you know anyone that does uh, like birds of prey? I don't know right now. I know if you contact like Wildlife Rehab Center in Grand Rapids, I think they do a little bit, and then they, they farm out some of it. They have another one that they send there. Do they? Okay, yeah. that one is uh, you know those and deer you need some pretty extensive rehab pens for, so there's not too many people that do them. But at the same token, birds of prey, everybody kind of wants to do if you have space. So you usually can find a place to farm those out too. So, yep. So, yeah. Do you ever have the turtles when you put them together, um, like not get along and fight each other? Because I owned two turtles once, and one of them started biting like the toes of the other turtle and the, around the eyes, and I had to take it to the turtle. So a lot of that is space. Um, so their rehab pens are. This, they're kind of, they're not huge, but they're probably 30 feet by 20 feet or so. And they're not heavily stocked. I mean, the plan is just to make sure they can get out there. They can forage for wild food. They can catch minnows. They can eat all that kind of stuff just to make sure that they're fine and they can get released at that point. So, and I always try to release them back to the area if they can, if it's not a super busy area um, of where they came from. Otherwise, I do make sure I put them in a population in the same county that they're known for and that too. So the protected species, um, if it's coming from a busy park in Grand Rapids or right next to a really busy street, I'll try to normally relocate them to a spot in the same county with the population. A big part of that though, is they get released in the spring. So I keep them all summer long, I hibernate them, and then they get released in the spring. So they have a whole season to find all the resources they need and get and you know settle in before they need to hibernate. A question from online. Do you offer tours of your rehab center at all? I just do it out of my house. I usually don't at all that <laughs> way. So, you know, it's a lot of people have said, why haven't you turned it into a nonprofit or a business? It's so much easier just to do it as an individual because I don't have to have a board then. I don't have to have all the board meetings. And it's just, you know, time is the biggest limiting resource. So, yep. So. Time no, this is just a hobby. I uh, I run a water treatment facility for the city of Granville. So, um, so no, this is just just a hobby. I just you know it keeps me busy in the summertime. So, I'm sure, and a little bit in the winter, but most of them are hibernating or past the you know intensive care type aspect. So, so good, excellent, cool. One more question. Yeah. Um, oh. if you, so then, if it's your problem, do you get funding from any, like, I know you work with vets and stuff. And no, so I always, if somebody drops one off, I'll ask for a donation, but no, otherwise I just pay for it out of pocket. It's like it's easier that way because, you know, sometimes people are like, well, if I make a donation, can I get a tax thing? It's like, well, I'm not a nonprofit. So it's just, <laughs> it's just me. You know, it's, you know, I've got a couple of close friends that help with the rehab aspect, you know, especially if I'm out of town or something, but no, I don't, uh, I don't have any grant money or anything that way. So the end of the day, it's not that much money a year that it's like, well, you know, normally the donations cover most of it. So, so how did you become a, a rehabilitator? So I had to go through the uh, International Wildlife Rehab Council's classes. They have a series of classes you have to take. Then you have to develop paperwork with the state. And then after that, it's really just uh, the DNR comes out and checks everything a couple times a year and cool. make sure that you're not mixing stuff with domestic animals and that kind of stuff. And, you know, it's funny because they always come out expecting to re, you know, we're going to, you know, ex look at your release pen for raccoons or all these things that are these big extensive things. Like, we don't know what to look for for turtles. <laughs> like, well, this is what I do. Like, okay, looks good. So, you know, you know, they're looking for, yeah, flight pens, make sure the deer can't get out, make sure the raccoons aren't going to escape. And, you know, I don't have any, I don't have any of that aspect. Just, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Cool. Yep. In the back. So I have a pretty large building at work that's unheated, 
that's where we keep all of our snow equipment all summer long. In the winter time, it moves up to a front building. So in that area, I set up temporary ponds and fill them up, you know, actually like the little kid collapsible side ones. And then I set them up in there where there's aerators and I put live tank heaters in there set to 36 degrees, just so they weren't gonna freeze. Um, and I move them into there and that's where they, all the water turtles will hibernate that way. I also have a big tub of a mix of peat moss, uh, sand and dirt for the box turtles that they're gonna, you know, that way. And that way it's a sheltered area so they're not getting the temperature swings like they would outside I can monitor them still all year long, you know, but it's not necessarily, you know, hard to access or anything that way. So it's a very fortunate situation. So, yeah, so good. awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much for coming out tonight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So.